Hey everyone, welcome to my show, Going From Thousands to Millions. I'm really, really excited to have Brent from Sierra Group here today. Brent, how are you? Good, mate. Good. Excited to be here as well. Well, thanks for joining us. Look, we met each other on Instagram, which is a bit of a theme with people that I bring on my show. How long has it been? Has it been a year since, you know, we... Yeah, I think probably even longer, mate. I was thinking about that today. I think it's probably a couple of years that we've just been, you know, the friendship sort of evolved nearly like pen pals across uh, Instagram. Yeah. There you go. So, mate, you know, um, I just wanted to get to know you myself and also for the audience. You have a great story. Um, there's a lot that I like to ask you and get to know you and about what you do and all that. So to get started, give us a bit of a background. How old are you? Mate, I just turned 33 in March. So. Okay, good. So, and <laughs> what you young, I think. You are very young, mate. You're still very young. So tell me, 33, um, take me back to high school. So you're born where? Where'd you grow up? Give us a bit of a background. Mate, I'm born and bred in Brisbane. Um, my dad was a builder and uh, hardworking blue-collar um, guy and built a big building business and never wanted me to become a carpenter or a builder. And so um, they spent a lot of money on my education and sent me to a top private school here in Brisbane. And um, I finished school. I, I did really well at school and I, I didn't find school overly difficult. If I'd really applied myself, I think I could have really excelled. But I, uh, I'm a bit of a rogue as well. So, you know, that probably <laughs> distracted me a little bit. Uh, finishing school, I went to university, QUT. And I went for about three months because while I was at university, I was also Ricky's laboring full time. And so I was working from 6.30 in the morning till 2.33 in the afternoon, five days a week. And then I was going to university uh, over night time. I changed all my tutors and lectures to night time. But it was uh, pretty short lived because uh, when you got home from Ricky's laboring, the last thing you wanted to do was go to university. And I quickly realized that it wasn't the path for me as well. And so coming from that building background and property, I absolutely love property and, um, you know, I love construction as well. And I always wanted to be making money from something in the property or construction industry. And at school, I'd done work experience with uh, FKP, which is a really big developer here in Brisbane. They've since um, dissolved and, and become Avio Group and uh, one of the uh, FKP owner's son, Tim Forrester, is Aria Property Group, which is a really well-known residential developer in the country and, and um, really more so up here in Brisbane. Yeah. And so I'd had that experience and exposure to property development. And uh, at university, I was doing property and economics. And then, uh, like I said, I was Bricky's laboring. So I made a decision. I wanted to do something uh, with my hands. So a carpentry apprenticeship. And that way I would do my apprenticeship, save some money, buy my first house, renovate it, flip it, sell, you know, make money that way. And so that's what I did. So what, so, okay. So what made you do the, why did you do the brick laying? Why did you do that? What was the was reason just, behind that? I was always working. I uh, had a job from when I was 13. I was working at Hungry okay. Jacks, Target, yeah. Lovers Nielsen, City Beach. Yeah. I used to labor on school holidays for a company called AWX. I worked yeah. at a tree farm, a meat works, absolutely everything you could possibly imagine. And so when I was going to university, a mate of mine had lost his license for drink driving and he was Ricky's laboring for uh, his uncle. Yeah. And so he needed somebody to drive him to work and somebody to help him work. And yeah. so I, I sort of, that's how I got into Ricky's laboring and I was earning $20 an hour. It's a lot of money back then. Yeah. $160 a day. Plus I was going to university. You know, I was, I was, uh, I thought I was on cloud nine. <laughs> so tell me what, so why, so you obviously went to a great school. You were you got a great results. You went to a top university in Queensland. And why? What was the changing moment that you said, you know what, this is not for me? Because I can imagine that wouldn't have been easy. Um, you know, your parents have invested a lot of money, sent you to a good school. You got into a great course. Um, was there a lot of pressure on you? to continue down that course because, and I'm just thinking out loud here because you didn't want to let your parents or anybody else down in, you know, because you, yeah. you, that does cross your mind. Um, so was there a lot of pressure for you to continue doing what was like a path that was kind of set in motion? And then also what did it take a lot and what did it take for you to say, you know what, this is not for me. I'm actually going to make that decision. What, what was, if you do remember going back there, what was going through your head? 
I, I've always been really independent and my parents definitely wanted me to go and um, get a higher education and take that university route. Yeah. But, and, and I know that I was very nervous when I wanted to tell my dad that I was going to do a carpentry apprenticeship. And I've seen the battles that he's been through, not only uh, financially through the building industry, but also bad back and body and all those things that can happen from a lot of manual labor. And um, I actually spoke to my great aunt first um, and, and spoke to her and, and said, you know, I'm, I'm going to make this decision. And she was really supportive. And then uh, I can remember exactly where I was standing when I told my dad, to be honest. Obviously, I was nervous because that's why we normally remember those things. Yeah. And um, my mind was made up. It wasn't going to be changed. And uh, like I said, I was always very independent. And so once I made that decision, you know, that was final. And, and my parents really didn't have they weren't trying to control me or, or, or force me down a certain path. They just wanted to provide me with an opportunity to, to, you know, you know, have the best life that I could. And, yeah. um, you know, they're very supportive. They're not super hands on. I'm su- still super independent and, uh, yeah, it's, it's worked out well so far. Okay. So it makes sense because like, I can imagine people, you know, it's, it's a difficult decision. You know, I know for me, you know, dropping out of uni was a difficult decision. And the reason why I asked was like, I was like, oh, well, you know, I don't want to let my parents down because they invested so much in me. But again, like yourself, for me, it was like, no, I don't want to do this. This is not me. And I don't want to go. It's funny because a lot of people get stuck in a nine to five job that they don't want to do, but they're afraid to make that jump or make that change, you know, yep. or, or even in relationships, mate, people get stuck in relationships for 40, 50 years because of the comfort zone and they don't want to leave their relationship. Because they feel guilty or they feel bad, you know. So yes, it's interesting yep. how those things happen. So you decided to drop out, go and do your carpentry course. So how long did you do that for? Uh, so a carpentry apprenticeship goes for four years. Uh, I was super determined, and I was signed off in just under three. <laughs> I, uh, I uh, you know, everything that I've ever done, I've put one hundred and twenty percent into, yeah. including that apprenticeship, and so. What actually happened is I was indentured to my first boss. So that means, you know, he gave me my apprenticeship and my start and I worked for him for about a year and I was working for his brother on weekends and they had a falling out. And so uh, I sort of got given an ultimatum and told that I wasn't able to work for the other brother on weekends if I, you know, and and so I ended up making a decision to swap who I was doing my apprenticeship with and, and move across to the other brother. But I then indentured myself to my dad and I actually subcontracted myself out. So I uh, wasn't an employee. I was really working for myself as an apprentice, a little bit of a strange scenario. Yeah. And I just made sure that I completed all my TAFE as quickly as I could and right. uh, was signed off, you know, really quickly. So you actually started a bit of a business in a way because you were actually a consultant in a way. Yeah, Sub- I was a sole yeah. trader, subcontractor. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, all right. Carbon uh, <laughs> invoice book. Yeah, I remember then. I remember them. You used to write it and come out on the other papers. You rip one for yourself and give the other one to the other person. So tell me, and then tell me about your first property. So how old were you when you bought your first property? Tell me where you bought it, if you don't mind, what it cost you, and what did you do with it? Yeah, so I bought my first property when I was uh, 21, just turning 22. And so I was saving really hard um, to do that. It was a goal. I was living at home until I bought that property, and I decided I didn't want to rent. So I was working in a golf driving range on weekends, um, Saturday afternoon, two till nine, Sunday morning, seven till two. I'll never forget because I didn't look forward to it every week. And uh, I was also doing carpentry around the clock when I, when I wasn't doing that. So I bought it at 21. It was in Rochdale South, which is uh, just south of Brisbane in Logan. And I think I paid $403,000 for it. Auction or private sale? No, private sale. And uh, that would have been 2008, nine, yeah. uh, just off the back of the GFC. Yeah. Um, I did it with a, um, about a 10% deposit, which I'd saved up and the first home buyers grant and all that sort of stuff. And then I, I really went on a bit of a journey for a while. I, I worked out that although I needed to renovate that property and make money from it, which I did, I turned it into dual occupancy. I rented out separate rooms in it. Yeah. Um, and it was really good from a cash flow perspective. Yeah. Um, I also, I guess, in reflection, it wasn't a great choice from a capital growth point of view, that property, but yeah. it did it did enable me to have good cash flow, pay it off, um, well, not pay it off completely, yeah. but make significant repayments, et cetera. But I also decided that I needed to advance myself in my career, and that was to move from carpentry to uh, site supervision. 
and then site supervision, construction management and learn as much as I could about the whole construction process and obviously earn more money along the way. So I actually went up to Mackay and uh, left my house in Brisbane and rented out the room separately and managed that. And um, I went to Mackay for a couple of years to get some more experience up there. So, uh, but the property itself, I, I ended up selling it in 2015. I think I sold it $530,000, so 130000 more. But I would say I never went back and checked the budget, but I probably spent every dollar of that additional money on the home. It really wasn't capital growth. It was just forced savings into the renovation. And that's fine. And that's totally fine. Everybody does it for a different reason, but also you get a lot of experience. So tell me, so you did that. And then what made you start the Sierra Group? What, what made you, how did that come about? Did you sit there, put a business plan together? Did you, uh, you know, how long did you think about it? And, and how did it start? And just give us a bit of a background on that. Yep. Yeah. So I was always heading towards that development path. And in my um, advancement in construction, I ended up construction manager for a builder in Brisbane that built a lot of townhouse developments. Yeah. And so, you know, you sort of go with what you know. And, and I started to learn a lot about the townhouse developments. I'd speak to all the developers that we were building for, find out absolutely everything I could. And uh, I was in a position where I could sell my house in Rochdale and pull out enough equity to be able to buy a property to do four townhouses. Okay. My plan. And so I used to walk around all of the areas, um, Mount Cravat and Camp Hill and Carina, which are all areas in the inner east here in Brisbane. Yeah. And I would measure up the size of the block and what townhouses went on there and look at the prices because I'm not a town planner. Yeah. I'm not an architect. I'm yeah. not from a development background. So to do the numbers, I really reverse engineered everything. Yeah. And um, so, yeah. And then I, I decided... I had I was in a position to be able to do that. That was 2014, and then I uh, I acquired my first development site in 2014, and it turned from one site into two properties. The neighbour ended up doing a deal, and four townhouses turned into ten. Wow! And, uh, yeah, and so and then 2015 I started construction on that, and and that's sort of the the beginning of Sierra and that and that story. Okay, awesome. And then what? So what what do you do? Do you keep or do you turn them over? Yeah, I develop and sell. So okay, cool. So and then from there, tell us what you're doing now. What are you working on now? What are you doing now? Yeah, so we've done um, over seventy properties in the last wow. five years. That's um, big. Yeah, it's quite quite a few. <laughs> it's quite That's a few. Awesome. You know, a lot of a lot of people that have trusted us to buy property, and and uh, you know it's a really big decision, and it's uh, the properties that we're doing are six, seven. Um, up to a million, 700,000 to a million dollars. So they're, they're big financial decisions. So, uh, mate, we're really focused on continuing to deliver um, in that resident, multi-residential space here in Brisbane yeah. and uh, expanding a little bit geographically and also in size of project. At the moment, I've sort of sat around the 10 townhouse um, size project and yeah. we're starting to, to move up into the larger 20 townhouses, 30 units sort of space. Um, at the moment, obviously, subject to everything that's happening, and we're, we're making that uh, progression in a, in a really pragmatic way, where we're sort of taking it easy, and we don't want to, you know, turn yeah. become the biggest developer in Brisbane overnight. Yeah. But we're just heading down that path, and we've got a few little split strategies as well. So, mate, exciting times for us at the moment. Um, that's awesome. So, tell me, like, um, what do you, in terms of the plan? Do you just so you buy a block, you find a block, you buy the block. You get the permits, you get the design and the permits and everything, and then you start construction. Do you sell off the plan or do you wait until it's finished and sell it? Or do you actually go out and sell even before you find a project? You find a project before you even start building or what is, yeah. how, do you, how do you do it? No, we find the land and I'm very um, selective about you know what criteria that needs to meet um, yeah. for, for our brand and, and our buyers and, and that. So uh, we find the land and then we design the development. And that process is, you know, that, that's a lot of unknown still at that stage with uh, what the council is going to allow us to do and what the, what the finished product is going to be. But I take it right through to uh, commencing construction. And then I found with my size projects and with the buyers, we really haven't got that sales traction until the project's about 50% constructed. Okay. So yeah. we've really been monitoring and tweaking that as we went along. So there's a couple of different ways. If you do do pre-sales, obviously yeah. um, you can reduce your cost of financing because uh, major banks are willing to jump on board and um, there's a little bit less risk there for them. But I've gone down the road where I have a lot of good relationships with what we call second tier lenders yeah. and uh, they're willing to start with our pre-sales. So, you know, sometimes, you know, it's, it's 
financially it might be um you know sort of six or one half dozen the other which is the better result in the long run but because we do build our own developments yeah. i want to make sure i've got continuity for my construction team yeah. and so by being able to make a start and, and really program that rather than waiting on pre-sales we can we can keep projects flowing and, and project that pipeline yeah, that's pretty cool i've actually seen some of the projects that you do on instagram and one of the things that i like about what you do is you do quality projects like they the finishes look fantastic you know and is that what you're aiming for? Good quality finish? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean I, I, we've spoken about this before. I'm a bit of a perfectionist. So I really yeah. want to make sure that our brand stands for, you know, it, it is the benchmark for quality. And whether that's in a $400,000 home, $700, $1.5 million, it needs to be the highest quality that we can do it. And yeah. so that's, you know, I think that's what will set us apart in the long run. And this is a long game for us. So yeah. I just want to make sure that, you know, we're setting the benchmark. Yeah, that's awesome. So tell me, how'd you come up with the name Sierra Group? Where does that come from? How'd well, you come up with that? It's a bit of a, yeah, I guess it's a bit of a story. You know, when you're starting a business, um, that's probably one of the harder things to do, you know, because you do, you're trying to make a decision that's going to, um, you know, there's a little bit of your own personal pride involved as well. So you want, you know, is it your personal name that you use? Um, is it a name that has significance to your story or, or what you're doing? And, and so I went through that battle as well. And I did actually have um, a couple of other businesses along the way. And when I reflect on those names, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> they're not, uh, they're not my favorites, but um, mate, I had somebody come in a marketing or uh, brand uh, creative person and, and yeah. he advised, you know, it's good to have a brand that means something, you know, whether it's Oak and it's long lasting yeah. it's strong, and all these things and gave me all these sort of things to think about. And one day I was just, uh, my son had actually just been born. I was at the hospital and, some reason I thought of Sierra Nevada mountain ranges and then became Sierra and then dropped an R out of it. And it really just evolved. And you wow. know, it's easy now to analyze it and say, you know, Sierra Nevada, it's mountain range, long lasting stands out and all those things. But subliminally, maybe I did those things, but you know, maybe I, I took it off that. a Sierra uh, four wheel drive, the little <laughs> Suzuki Sierra. I might have been I following remember them. I remember those cars. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're a good little four-wheel drive. They're that light. Yeah. <laughs> how funny. So tell me, you look back now. So you've been doing this for how many years now? Five, uh, five years full-time, yeah. yeah. Okay. You look back now and you look at the decision that you made before that in terms of you know, leaving uni, doing your apprenticeship, going through the motions. So, you know, there's no shortcuts. You, you did it from ground up and you, you, know, you did it the hard way. You did it the right way. You did your apprenticeship. You went and worked for a number of years. You moved up in that uh, you know sec uh, sector you learned everything as you should you look back now you happy with the decision that you made is it was it worthwhile yeah definitely and, oh. and and i always look at that and think could i have shortcutted it you know was there another way to get to where i am yeah. but you know this is my story and i'm really proud of it and i wouldn't change things along the way there's certainly things that could have turned been different and turned out different but you know, I'm, I'm here where i am now and and i'm, I'm excited and proud about that and i think it was i love that I love that. So tell me if you could do anything different, what would it be? Uh, I don't, I, I genuinely don't have any regrets. I mean, there's little, there's probably little things that we could all do differently on a day to day basis, but no, nothing, nothing major. You know, I would have loved to have been doing it in Sydney and Melbourne over the last five years, uh, despite the, the property downturn, I, you know, maybe I'd have a bigger office and a bigger workbook, but um, <laughs> made up, nah, I'm happy. I'm really happy. You know, I love that. So, you know, this shows about obviously entrepreneurship and stories like yours, man. Like, you know, stories from, you know, people building stuff up from ground up. Um, and one of the things that I really want to focus on and give back to the audience is, you know, if you had any advice for anyone, young or old, anyone that's, you know, doubting, you know, currently stuck in a rut, they don't know what to do. They, you know, they want to start a business. They don't know where to start or they want to make changes to their life where they're afraid to make that change because fear really stops people from, living their life to the fullest yep. what would your advice be to them I, I i could give you know lots of advice whether it's good or not you know I'm, I'm not sure but i think everything takes you know hard work it takes a lot of dedication perseverance um nothing happens overnight you know nothing you know some people might start a business and in 12 months they're making millions of dollars and those unicorn scenarios happen but in most cases you know these things take a long time take a lot of blood sweat and tears and you know that's a, a very well-known saying but it, it rings true but i would say that for anybody who and and i personally 
think about, you know, what is my vision? Where do I want to go? I set goals that I've, I've surpassed well and truly. And now it's a bit of a moving, a moving beast. And I have to have to reassess and think, what are my goals again and refocus and work out those things. And sometimes I don't know what I want to do and where I want to be. You know, it gets, it, it, it is a difficult thing to know what, who you want to be. And, and I would just say, maybe just work at the little things for people who are unsure, you know, chip away at the little things. And then I think the big things happen. So if it's maybe just doing a little bit of extra learning, listening to podcasts, reading books, improving yourself, improving your relationships, improving your health, all, if you just work incrementally away at becoming a better person and being clear about who you want to be as a person, I think then doors open up to you and you get exposed to things and people get to go down a, a road. I, don't, I certainly don't think you can just have this mentality where you just want to have money and want to have cars and, and that's the soul burning desire. You know, I think you have to focus on things that make you happy and, um, and just chip away at it. And I think the good things come off the back of that. It's so true. You know, they say Rome wasn't built overnight, you know, and it's so true. I think what you said is spot on. It's about, a pers- it's about making a start, showing up and making a start. It's about persistence and about resilience. Uh, because you know it's not easy and as you said you know you got those unicorn cases when do things happen and big things happen in six to 12 months and you hear those great stories but that's far and far between you usually it's not like that you know it's going to take a long time it's going to take 12 24 36 48 months and there's going to be times that you go you know what why am i doing this this is yep. too hard i could go and get a nine to five job put in a couple hundred grand in salary and have a good life you know yeah but but you gotta, you gotta, you gotta not give up. And you know, exactly like what you said again, you gotta continue to chip away. And as you chip away, new doors open. But you expect it the least, you know, when you don't expect something to happen, because you're so, you know, you're so dedicated and you're chipping away, things happen. Yeah. And about, it's about taking those things and going on those journeys that make you who you are and make your journey what it is and just make you who you are in your business what it is. So you're hundred percent right. So tell me, what do you do for fun? How do you do, do you relax? What do you do for fun? Do you play sports? What do you like doing? Oh, I've, I've heard other people on your podcast say, you know, I don't really switch off. And I, I think, you know, a lot of us are, are the same in that regard. And, and that's a problem actually. You know, I, some people say to me, Oh, you're a million miles now. I say, well, you probably wouldn't want to live in my mind to be honest. You know, it's a pretty busy place at times. Yeah. So switching off is difficult. I've got a beautiful wife and, and two um, gorgeous little kids, four and two, and uh, they keep me really busy when I'm not at work. And so there's no exuberant um, hobbies at the moment. It's really just about um, family outside of, you know, yeah. it's not that exciting probably for everyone to listen to, but, yeah, but it, is, uh, it, it is family. And I'm, I'm just and so aware and everyone says, it, you know, making sure we spend time with our family. And I am really, that is, you know, it's cliche to say it's my number one priority because I'm 33, they're two and four, probably by the time they're 12, 13, 15, they, they're going to want less to do with me and I, I'm going to need to be less hands-on, you know, all the time and, and I can build a business then, you know, if I needed to. So I just want to focus on work when I'm here and doing a good job of that and then focusing on being a good dad because my legacy is very much um, about my family and about my business as well. So when my kids are uh, super proud to call me dad and my wife still loves me, you know, that'll be um, a big achievement. And hopefully I've built a, a, a pretty um, great business as well. That's fantastic. And you're spot on, mate, because, you know, it's all about your legacy, you know, and everybody has their own legacy. And it's about, you know, looking back and saying, you know what, I did the right thing. I had fun doing it. And I've got a beautiful family to show for it amongst other things. Mate, it's been great talking to you. You know, I, I've, I, I love your story. And, you know, I've got to say a few things about you. Um, this is, I think, the first time we've really had a chat, actually, yeah, yeah. outside of Instagram. But what I love about people like yourself is that you have, you are just, you're just a good person. You, you've, you've, you know, you've supported me being a total stranger on Instagram for so many, as we said, number of years now. And, you know, I, I, that says a lot to me about you as a person. And, and, you know, you always give me feedback. And even with my podcast, you know, you send me screenshots saying you're listening to it. So it says a lot about who you are as a person. So I really wanted to say thank you for your support personally. And thank you for coming on the show and, show, and sharing your journey with me and our audience. And, and, I'll, and I'm looking forward to having you catch up with you in a year or two 
and see how things are going and what you're doing and you know where you are at. So that said, where can free people find you? So tell us a little bit about your Instagram, your social media, uh, yeah, how yeah. people tap into you and what you do with your business and everything else. Yeah, so uh, the business is Sierra Group. So obviously we've got a website, sierragroup.com.au. Uh, on Instagram, Sierra Group, pretty easy to find there. And, and we're across, you know, those platforms. Um, you won't find me personally, just a business presence there. I uh, haven't got enough time to do both things, unfortunately. But uh, mate, on, in terms of supporting, you know, I'm really, I, I honestly love when other people are successful. I really do. And I know how much hard work and, and perseverance and that goes into it. So I think, um, I think when you take off on your own adventure, you really realize those things and happy to try and, you know, all, all support each other where we can spot on i love that so thanks everyone thank you for joining us again thanks everyone for tuning in please listen to us on itunes spotify and tune into the youtube channel and check out this conversation and video as it comes as it comes up soon god bless have a fantastic day and look forward to the next podcast thanks mate thanks sam cheers mate cheers bud.